Hello, it's Matt, it's All Saints. So good to be with you today. I'm Paulo, pastor of 430 Church. It's great to be able to gather together. One of the things I've been really encouraged with over the last couple of weeks is the way, even though we're meeting in all sorts of different places, all sorts of rooms around Sydney, around New South Wales, maybe even around the world, the way still our great God and His Holy Spirit transcends all of that and brings us together, that strong sense that as we meet as God's people around the word of Jesus, he unites us. We are his people right here, right now. You might want to chuck your own encouragement down. Uh, you might notice just here on the right is uh, this chat bar. Uh, please feel free to put your own encouragement down there. Can I also say, if this is your first time with us here, uh, we're really excited to have you with us. Maybe you're joining us from another church. Maybe this is your first time in church. Uh, it's been interesting times for us and you're wondering what Jesus might have to say into this situation. We're really glad that you've joined us. We see Jesus transforms life and uh, we would love to share how he does that with you. Uh, you might notice up in the right corner there, uh, there's a communication card. Uh, please let us know that you've joined us. We'd love to hear from you and there are a few options you can mark down there of, uh, of how you might get in contact with us and how we might be able to help you. We're going to sing right now. Uh, that's one of the great things we get to do as God's people. And even though we're in separate places, we can still do that together. Uh, if uh, you're like me, you've got a voice like me, you might want to turn the volume up quite a bit loud so you can belt it out without causing other people too much distress. But how about we do that right now? Let's sing our praises to our great God. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make all again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All power
as God's people, we're encouraged not to stay distant and hide in our sin, but to draw near, as it says in, in, in Hebrews, uh, to draw near to God's throne of grace, where we can find grace and mercy in our time of need. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to pray this prayer of confession as God's people. So join me now, uh, together with everyone else, and let's pray this prayer out loud. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbours as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we've failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbours and to live for your honour and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, he who knew no sin became sin so that in him we might become the children of God. It is a throne of grace that we're able to approach. If we've confessed our sins, God has forgiven us. We are his children. Let's continue to delight in that. One of the... Uh, helpful things over the last few weeks is just to hear the, some of the sobering stories of our brothers and sisters who are facing challenging times at the moment, but also to be encouraged to see how their faith makes a difference. Let's hear a few of those stories. Hi everyone, I'm Andrew. And I'm Katie. And we are part of the 10am congregation at St Matt's. The way that COVID-19 has affected us, uh, I'm a pilot for Qantas, and so you would have read in the news that they've stood down about two thirds of their workforce. And so I'm thankful that I haven't actually been stood down just yet, uh, but I expect that to happen in the next few weeks as these travel restrictions that the government keeps enforcing uh, take effect. So I'm uh, just working through that and uh, the possibility of having to find alternative work. Another way we've been impacted is we are expecting our second child in the next three weeks. And again, with increasing health regulations, that's changed a lot of our plans and expectations for how that was going to look. I can no longer go in for regular appointments with midwives. Um, I can't have any visitors at the hospital. I'm not even sure how long I can stay in hospital after I give birth. Um, we don't have the same support systems in place that we would have had otherwise because of the way the government is encouraging social distancing. So those sorts of things have really changed and challenged our understanding of what the next season of our life is going to look like. Hey church, um, I'm Noni, if you don't know who I am. Um, yeah, so my life at the moment, like many people, looks very different to how I sort of planned this part of my year to look. Um, I deferred from uni um, earlier in the year um, just because I sort of needed some time away from that to just rethink what I wanted to be studying and what direction I wanted to be taking. Um, yeah, so my plan was to um, work primarily for this first part of the year, um, but like many people recently, um, I lost my job, um, which has yeah not only created a bit of a financial situation that's stressful um, but it's also just impacted my time um, you know I haven't had um, I've been spending a lot of time at home recently and I haven't had that main thing like uni or work dominating my time um, yeah and that spare time that I now have has sort of just made me feel a bit lost and a bit purposeless um, which has been an interesting thing to juggle um, but yeah, not only that, um, I just think the whole uncertainty of this situation has just, um, yeah, been something that's been really hard to deal with recently. Just not knowing how long this will go on for or, um, yeah, how long it will be until I get to do things like see my friends again um, has just been quite hard to deal with at the moment. Having faith has been so important in this sort of a change. I'm learning that I am someone who really desires control and God is showing me again and again that he is sovereign and I'm remembering that he would know everything that's going to happen. He knows the plans for our lives. And so I'm praying through the unexpected changes that keep coming 
I'm praying through my desire to want to just know and be uh, able to plan and prepare um, and just trusting that God will sustain us in times when we might not have the support that we had hoped for. I've seen others uh, been stood down, um, become fearful, uh, fearful for loss of income, fearful for how it will impact their families. Um, by contrast, we we aren't fearful. Uh, our faith in Christ comforts us, and we we know that we have hope um, for eternity with God. And so, in that way. Um, our faith is helping us uh, to remain grounded. Also, others in my industry find their identity quite seriously in the role that they do. Um, it's a, a very passionate industry, and I'm passionate about my industry as well. But um, people do find their identities in what they do. And I uh, am trying, well, I'm finding my identity in Christ uh, in this situation and that helps me just to look through everything that's happening and uh, see the greater glory um, that is Christ crucified. Mm. Um, that's not to say that we don't have worries, we do, um, but as they come up we're trying to put them to God and he's blessed us with comfort um, many times and we just pray that that will continue happening. So I actually read something in Philippians which helped me in thinking about my answer to this question that I thought I'd share with you guys. So um, from, the, from chapter 4, starting at verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So this passage just reminded me that in our faith, we have a God who is incredibly loving, um, who is near in our struggles, um, who listens to us when we cry out to him, and who is a God of peace and who gives us peace. And yeah, those were just really cool things to be reminded about, about our faith. Um, yeah, and just knowing that through this time, we have a God who is near in our struggles, who's present. And not only that, but he's in control of those periods of struggling. Um, they, these are truths I have to remind myself of constantly, especially during this time. But they're just so good. Um, I think as well, my faith has helped me through this time because it's reminded me of my purpose and my identity as a child of God. Um, which has helped me to just rethink the way that I look at this time, um, choosing to see it more as um, an opportunity and a gift from God, um, as a way and an opportunity to be spending more time learning about Him, serving Him, and then being able to apply that to thinking about um, the direction I want to take in my life. Hi, I'm Tomo. I go to the 10 a.m. service at All Saints West Linfield, and the Bible reading comes from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 17. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when a centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith, even in Israel. 
Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Well, hi, I'm Phil, and I'm the pastor at All Saints. Thanks for joining us uh, for our online service. Look, hopefully you recognise this hammer beside me, either because of uh, Norse mythology or because you've watched the whole Avengers series. You'd recognise that it belongs to Thor. And on the side of the hammer is this inscription. Whoever wields this hammer who is worthy will have the power of Thor. And we like that idea because it means that if you had this hammer and its power, you can rule over Asgard, you can rule over other kingdoms, you can defeat all sorts of baddies. It's a great power to have. And it's a really a great narrative which we like even today because the idea is that it's very egalitarian. Whoever is worthy, okay, whoever is shows by their life, whoever by the way in which they've worked hard and diligent, will have power and authority and will have other people who will listen to them, will follow them, will be doing the things which they want. And so here is this idea that by my worth, you can see all that I will achieve and you can see my control over all things. And I remember one time uh, on Parkinson, uh, this famous uh, footballer came on and he talked about what it was like to go into the, into the stadium and to hear the accolades and the noise around about you and the adulation and to realise you're about to be involved in this gladiatorial type of event where really life and death depend on what you're about to do. And then he described being in the hospital next to his four-year-old son who was dying of cancer and realised that actually it wasn't that important at all. In fact, all he was doing was kicking a ball. And all of a sudden, the bubble burst. Sickness broke into this whole narrative which says how much we can achieve and, and do by our own worth because, well, his world was rocked by his sick son. And the centurion in our story today has his world rocked by a sick servant. And we ourselves are currently having our whole understanding of the world rock too because we're used to having things work as we expect them to work but this pandemic is taking over and so i want us to have a look at this centurion to understand the way in which he gets the right perspective so that we'll learn from him and we'll take on the same view ourselves now the question we have today is well who is worthy who exactly is worthy of my time who, who is worthy of my energy who is worthy of me giving up what I was going to do to meet their expectations. Now, there are two contenders in our passage today. The first contender is given by the elders, and they actually think uh, that it's the centurion himself. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, open to uh, Luke chapter 7. Let me just read from verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all to this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The servant heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. And so Jesus went with him. That's quite extraordinary, because they're speaking of someone who's not Jewish, He's a Gentile, and they're saying to Jesus, hey, listen, we know that you've got this amazing thing going on. You've got all these people here, but, but we want you to leave this massive crowd and go to this particular person's house and do whatever he asks, because he, we think he's worth it. You know, I think, wow, you really hold this guy in, in high regard. Why do you think he's so special? And there are three reasons. Firstly, it's because of his rank. You see, he's a centurion. Uh, whether it's in the, the Roman army or in Herod's personal army, he, he's still an officer. He still has about 100 soldiers underneath him. He's about the rank of a captain. So firstly, it's because of his rank. But secondly, it's because he's a good guy. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but, well, he had high regard for his servant. Now, in the first century, uh, in many ways, servants are a bit a dime a dozen. Uh, they have a high mortality rate. They only live to about the age of 17. Okay, so one dies, you get another one along, they'll die, another one comes. You just get used to the whole pattern. But here, this centurion is concerned for his servant, 
as is sick. He actually has compassion and kindness. That, that says something about his character. But thirdly, it's because he is concerned for God's people. I mean, it talks about his love for them, and his love is expressed in the fact that he built them in a synagogue. Whether it was uh, that he put the money up or whether he got through the, the cut through the red tape to make it possible, we're not sure. But what we do know is that he made a synagogue in Capernaum a reality. Now, up on your screen is uh, an archaeological uh, picture of what uh, the, the synagogue looked like. Uh, could have been the first or second century, but it was a white limestone look, so against the grey sort of buildings around about, it stood out as a quite a good sized building which he provided for them so that the Jewish people in Capernaum could gather together. So for these reasons, the elders are saying, this, this guy here, he's worth it. Jesus, he is worth your time. It's worth you taking your efforts to do what he is asking for, based on merit. And our world understands that. Second contender. Well, the centurion says that the person who truly is worthy is Jesus. If you get your Bibles open again, let me uh, read from the next section in verse 6. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now, here we start to see a picture of a man who's in authority and bowing down to someone else who he recognises as greater. In fact, he says, Jesus, I recognise that you are so great that I shouldn't even have you come into my home. And remember, the elders held him in high regard. Now, it's because of who he sees Jesus being. He thinks Jesus is Lord. And, and that's not a small thing, okay, to say, because remember, he's in an army. He understands he's a centurion and he's got a prefectus over him. And he's got a goddess and then he's got Caesar. But he's saying over those ranks, you're Lord. I mean, they may rule over people and over a, an empire, but, but you rule over everything. And notice he gets also the understanding about power and authority. Because if, if you have power and authority coming together, okay, in the right sphere, all you need to do is say a word and it happens. So if you're a prime minister and you have the authority and the power, you can say, go to war and it will happen. If you're a parent and you have the power and authority, you can say, brush your teeth and it will happen. And we keep praying for the power and authority in our households as well. But the idea is quite clear, isn't it? If you have the right power and authority, you just need to speak. Of course, if you overreach, then you look silly. So imagine, for example, if a politician or a doctor stood up and said, COVID-19, stop. I mean, you think, what are you doing? I mean, like, come on, that, that's not going to work. You've overreached in your power. Now, the centurion looks at Jesus and says, I think you're Lord. And I think by a simple word, you are able to change what's happening to my servant because you have power and you have authority. That's an amazing sentiment which he has at this stage, where he thinks that Jesus is the one who rules. Or to put it another way, in the words of Luke, he sees Jesus as the Christ. I don't know if you remember, but uh, a while back I spoke from Luke chapter 4, where Jesus explains his mission. He read a passage from Isaiah which says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. So Jesus said, you know what, I'm coming for the very purpose of bringing new creation. All the problems in this world, I'm going to set people free from. And the centurion's hope is that Jesus will release his servant from the oppression of sickness. And in fact, Jesus does it without even speaking a word. That's the power which he has. So here the centurion recognises Jesus' mission. 
Now, I don't know if you remember back in Luke chapter 4, but Jesus explains there who will benefit from his mission. And he talks about, uh, for example, uh, Elijah going to this widow and uh, helping her with food, but also her son dies. And, well, he brings that son back to life, which is, if you're reading Luke chapter 7, the next story is about a widow who loses her son and is brought back to life. For that matter, Jesus also in Luke chapter 4 talks about Elisha because, you know what? There's a soldier who comes from another nation and he comes to Elisha because he's sick, which is like here in Luke chapter 7 where we have someone from another nation who is a centurion and has someone who's sick and he's seeking help. He's basically saying, Jesus, I can't do anything. It's outside my control. I'm looking to you. And Jesus answers. So, it's not the centurion who is worthy, but Jesus. And now it's Jesus' turn. And he wants to speak about the centurion's faith. And have a look with me, if you will, at verse 9. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Well, I don't know how you feel if you're in the crowd because basically you're the people who are meant to get him and he's turning around to these people, God's people, and saying, you guys don't get what this guy as a Gentile does. You haven't got it at all. And so Jesus is amazed. In fact, the only other time that Jesus is amazed is in Mark chapter 6 when he goes back to his, his hometown and, and people have seen him for many, many years and they don't believe in him. They don't follow him. This guy who's never met Jesus says, I get who you are. I understand it. And, and at that stage, Jesus says, I'm amazed by your faith. Now, faith is putting your trust in someone. And you can put your trust in a whole lot of people. But there are some areas where, again, there is that, that sense you could overreach. You could trust in someone and be disillusioned. So often in life, when it comes to control, we either trust in ourselves, when that fails, we'll trust in governments, when that fails, we'll trust in progress or science and technology. Now the problem is, if they don't work out, we don't know what to do next. So we become disgruntled, we start to run around in a panic, we buy as much toilet paper as we possibly can and think that will somehow help ourselves out, but we don't know what to do. Now, Please notice that the centurion had a certain confidence that Jesus could bring his servant back from sickness. He trusted in him to have the power because he recognised that he was Lord over all. And so when sickness came, it didn't burst his bubble. He just recognised one who was greater than any other person who he knew or he had met. Now, friends, we are in a time when sickness has burst the bubble of so many people around about us. They thought they were in control. They're not. They thought they could trust themselves. They can't. And so I've now got three questions which I want to ask you. And uh, I would like, after I've finished, for you just to reflect on those questions too. Number one, are you trusting in Jesus as your Lord? That's an important one to ask. Because you may think, yeah, Jesus is an historical figure, but that's not going to help you now. Yeah, he's a good teacher, but that's not going to help you now. Do you think that Jesus is the one who rules over heaven and earth? That's what the centurion thought. And because of that, he sent the elders to ask him to help him out. Now, for us, we, we don't send people to Jesus. We pray to him. And it could be that today you, for the first time, are going to pray and say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. But if Jesus is your Lord, the way in which we show that is we pray. We wake up of a morning saying, Lord, this is another day which I don't know what's going to happen, but I trust in you. Lord, I'm anxious about what the day holds, but I'll hand it over to you because you rule over heaven and earth. Am I trusting in Jesus? Number two, as it comes to prayer, am I demanding or am I asking? It's interesting to look at the elders in the centurion. You see, the elders came to Jesus and said, listen, you've got to do this. This guy's done so many amazing things. You've got to help him out. Okay, it's kind of demanding. And it's very easy as Christians to come before Jesus and say, look, Jesus, I need you to do this, this, and this. And well, if you think about it, I've been a pretty good Christian so far. Am I demanding or am I like the centurion who has this amazing humility 
who says, look, Jesus, I didn't think I could even approach you. I recognise how great you are. I recognise even how small I am. I just seek your help. Now that, that's a, a different demeanour to have. And more than that, remember the rank bit? He understands that Jesus is the one who has the big plan. So I don't tell Jesus, here's the plan of what you have to do. He recognises, I'm part of your plan. Help me to trust in you. Help me to seek your wisdom. So in prayer, am I demanding or am I asking? Number three, do you see what Jesus is doing? Now, in many ways, we would expect that Jesus, when he comes to earth, would heal everyone, but he doesn't. In fact, there are a whole lot of people who don't get healed by Jesus. There are people who will still die after being healed by Jesus. And even today, we think, look, if I follow Jesus, everything will be fine. It's going to be a good life. But we misunderstand what Jesus is doing. Jesus came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, to bring the kingdom of God, to bring the new creation, which is to come. This current age is about sharing the good news that we can be friends with God and part of his kingdom for all eternity. That's what Jesus was doing, proclaiming the good news, what we do, and invite people to understand it and to follow him. Now, sadly, in this time, there's going to be more disaster. There's going to be more wars. There'll be more sickness. We're going to have our hearts broken. We're going to suffer grief. But we do so with hope. Because this world is not all that there is. Jesus is establishing a creation, a new world to come. And as we place our trust in him, we'll be part of it. And that's what makes him worthy. So will you put your trust in him? Friends, I'm going to leave you now to go and think about those three questions and spend some time after that praying and giving thanks to Jesus. Hi St. Matt's and All Saints, Chris Cipollone here. Uh, sorry I haven't been able to join you over the last couple of weeks online. Uh, I've been busy setting up the care programs, but it's a real privilege to join you today and a great joy to be able to lead us in a time of prayer. Uh, so please do bow your heads and join with me. Father God, we start by slowing down and remembering once more who you are. A God of love, a God of patience, a God of hope, a God of daily bread, a God of grace, a God of redemption. And we thank you that even though our circumstances change, you remain the same. We thank you for the words of Hebrews chapter 4, which remind us that we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, 
yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Lord Jesus, you know what it is to be human. Have compassion on us now, as we don't understand why things happen the way they do. Give us the kind of peace which transcends understanding. Help us to remember you first, and that in our times of uncertainty, that this would give us a deep peace and rest. Thank you for the reminder from Luke's Gospel today that when we recognise our need before you, you always, always respond with kindness and mercy. Thank you for the grace you showed to the centurion, and thank you for the grace you continue to show to us now. We know that in this life there will be suffering and pain, and we pray for families who have lost loved ones, for others who are ill, for medical systems that are overburdened, for once stable incomes now lost, for countries so already impoverished and vulnerable that this is the last thing that they need. Lord, hear our prayers, and we ask that you would act with a kind of wisdom that we can only imagine in our wildest dreams. And for governments, we ask for a glimpse of that wisdom as they seek to lead well, trying to balance the health and economic implications. We thank you for the Australian government. We know that they won't get every decision right. We know that they are human. But we do thank you that we live in a country of stability and a desire to see the common good. Continue to give Scott Morrison, Brendan Murphy, and their team of advisors profound insight in this time. And while it's true that we will have suffering in this life, we also know that it's true that you call us to see your kingdom come on earth as in heaven. And in this time of need, help us to reach out with the loving arms of Jesus, supporting one another as a church, and also extending that arm to our local communities. Lord, we ask that you would redeem this situation for your glory and name. Where there is darkness, we ask that you would bring light. Where there is despair, we ask that you would bring hope. Where there is fear, we ask that you would bring love. And perhaps most importantly, where there is vulnerability, we ask that you would bring a fresh understanding to our world that we are completely dependent on you and have always been completely dependent on you. And when we come to you like the centurion, you respond with mercy and favour. We ask that many people would actually find faith in you for the first time. Father God, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you that we can come to you in confidence and that in doing so, you will give us grace and help us in our time of need. And it's in Jesus' great and powerful name that we lift these prayers to you. Amen. Friends, let's close together by saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust Sweetest friend, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in 
What another great week we've just had. I hope you've been really encouraged by that. It's so important for us to keep meeting together. Another way to do that this week is through a growth group. If you're not in a growth group, can I really encourage you to uh, connect up with one? And if you would like to do that, the way to do that is to contact uh, Natalie Ray here at St. Matt's All Saints and her email address is coming up on the screen now. Uh, just drop her an email, let her know uh, what your circumstances are and she'll be able to connect you up with the right group. It is so good to be together. Well, we've been challenged today, haven't we? Who is worthy? Who has the authority? Who has the power? Who should we put our trust in? Let's imitate the faith of the centurion this week and let's put our trust in Jesus. God bless you. <laughs>